Welcome to CMA's lecture on transmission electron microscopy for material sciences. In today's video, we will use the building block that we have seen before, the lenses, and see how we can put them together to get a working microscope with all its parts able to make the image of a specimen. There are many lenses in a microscope and they build three main groups which have different functionalities. The first one, before the specimen, is called the condensor lenses. These are the lenses used to form the beam that is exiting the gun and projected onto the specimen. The second block is the objective lens and its apertures. It's where we have the specimen and that is a very important lens used to make the first intermediate image of the specimen and also a diffraction pattern. And finally, we want to be able to change the magnification to look either at the image of the specimen or at its diffraction pattern and also to change the magnification of the diffraction pattern. That is done by the third group, which is made of the intermediate lens and projective lenses. So the first group, condensor lens, forms the beam, projected on the specimen. The objective lens make an image of the specimen and the intermediate and projective lenses will project this image on the recording device, magnify it or project the diffraction pattern and eventually magnify it. Why is it important to understand those lenses and how they work? Let's go to the microscope. So here we are at a real transmission electron microscope. This is a JOL 200 kilovolt, and you can recognize the same structure as we had before in the lecture. On the top, we have the gun. This is a 200 kilovolt field emission gun. Then we have the condenser lenses with condenser aperture. And below we have the objective lens with the specimen, the objective aperture, and hidden behind we have the selected area aperture. Further down we have the intermediate and projective lenses. And here on the table we have the computer for controlling the microscope and the control panel. There are a lot of knobs on this control panel and each of these knobs will have some influence on some of the lenses of the microscope. So, for example, this brightness knob controls the condenser lenses and the illumination on the specimen. If I change the focus knob, it will change the current in the objective lens. I can change the magnification, which will have an influence on the projective lens. I can switch to diffraction, that will change the projective and intermediate lenses. And I also can deflect the beam on, after, before the specimen. So it's very important to understand what you are doing when you operate the microscope. And for this, you know to understand the functioning of all those group of lenses. And that's what we will see now in the following part of the lecture. The condenser system forms the beam after the gun and projects it on the specimen. It is the first set of lens before the specimen and after the gun. And it is made of at least two lenses and one aperture. We will start with this simplest case of two lenses and one aperture. The first one on the top is called condenser 1. The second one just below is the condenser 2 and the aperture is the condenser 2 aperture. The specimen is further away and the beam formed by this set of lens will be projected on it. The gun is producing a crossover, which is a point where all the electrons will cross on the optical axis. This set of lenses will then form an image of this crossover and project it on the lens. In that simplest case which I've taken, 
the distance between lens and focal point is the same as the distance between focal point and object. So I know that in the schematic, I will have a magnification of exactly one and the image will form at the same distance as the object is. The drawing is therefore very simple. Depending on the strength of the C2 lens, I can form my last crossover exactly on the specimen, before the specimen or after the specimen. I will take the case where I formed it exactly onto the specimen. You see that the condenser to aperture actually limits the extension of the beam. I can redo the drawing in the reverse direction and I will know exactly what is the maximal opening of my beam. This part of the beam is cut by the aperture, while this one is kept by the aperture. I have here a maximal angle that will illuminate the specimen. It's called the illumination semi-angle alpha. If I change the excitation of the C2 lens, I will change the position of the focal point. By doing this, I will also change the position at which the crossover is formed. For example, if I increase the strength, the focal point will move closer to the lens and the strength of the lens will be stronger. I will have the same ray pass after C1 but after C2, as I will have a stronger lens, my crossover will form earlier. My lens will be in overfocus, my crossover before the specimen. The reverse is if I decrease the strength of C2, I will form my crossover after the specimen. If I want to know what would be the effect of changing the strength of C1, I have to redo my drawing and this time I will increase the strength of C1, which means I will have my focal point closer to the lens and the symmetric focal point also closer to the lens. In that case, the image of my crossover will not be at the symmetrical position as before. I have to do a complete drawing to know where to find it. With this drawing, I know the position of the image of my gun crossover and then I can draw the ray pass. I have to take rays with a slightly lower opening. I need to know the image of this crossover done by C2. I will adjust my C2 lens in such a way that the image is forming on the specimen and to have a convergent beam on the specimen. Adjusting the C2 lens means that I am allowed to change the position of the focal point. Now my constraint is that my object for C2 is there and my image for C2 is at that position. With this drawing I have the position for my new focal point f2 of the c2 lens. I also noticed something. Before I had a magnification of 1. Now I have a magnification between this as an object and that point as an image which is smaller. I can finalize the drawing by knowing that the rays will converge to the specimen and then eventually take into account the C2 aperture. Finally, by changing the strength of C1, I end up with a beam on the specimen with the same alpha as before when I'm converged on the specimen, but with a demagnified image of my source. I am working with a smaller spot of electrons on the specimen. And that's finally why we say that C1 control the spot size and C2 with its aperture 
will control the opening of the beam and the width of the illumination on the specimen. So, that was for a two condensor lens system. With the help of the appendix video, you will figure out by yourself how it works for a three condensor lens system. And now, let's go to the microscope. Okay, here we are again at the microscope. And I will show you the effects of the condensor lens system. This time, we see the image of the beam of electrons that would illuminate the place where we have the specimen. If I turn the knob called brightness, I can illuminate a larger or smaller place on my specimen. And this is done by changing the current in the uh, second condenser lens, which is called here CL3. I can also change the spot size, now we have spot 1, to increase it, for example, to spot 3, 4, 5, etc. This changes massively the current in the first condensor lens. And with this, I'm able to have a smaller illumination on my specimen. But now let's move on to the next building block of the microscope. The objective lens makes the first intermediate image and diffraction pattern after the specimen. It's a very important one. It has three main components, the lens itself and two aperture. At that height, we have the specimen. We can generally make a simple sketch where we have the optical axis, the specimen and the objective lens. We suppose that we know where we have the focal point f and f prime of the objective lens. First of all, we need to figure out where the image of the specimen is forming. With this, I see that I have an image formed below the lens with a small magnification. For simplicity, I will imagine that my illumination system, the condensor lenses, produces a parallel illumination on the specimen. Some of the electrons will interact weakly with the specimen and will exit the specimen parallel to the optical axis. Those electrons will be focused to the back focal plane of the objective lens. With this drawing, I know exactly that this point of the specimen corresponds to this point of the image. If I imagine that I have a series of electrons that are diffracted in the specimen, they will exit the specimen with the beam making an angle to the optical axis, but all the part of the specimen will diffract the same way, which means that all these rays will be parallel to each other. Still, rays exiting the specimen from that point will correspond to the same image point on the specimen. They will be focused by the objective lens to this point. The same holds for the next one and I can continue my drawing. Now what you can observe is that all those red rays cross at the same position in the back focal plane of the objective lens. That's something that you might have seen in your optics lecture. Rays that enter the lens parallel to each other but at an angle to the optical axis will be focused to a point in the back focal plane of the objective lens. Now we can connect the different parts of this drawing with the microscope. At that position, we have the specimen holder with the specimen. We have a first aperture. This one is the objective aperture and it is exactly situated in the back focal plane of the objective lens. 
we have a second aperture further down. This one is situated at the head of the first intermediate image of the specimen. This aperture is called the selected area aperture. Actually, if you want to go a little bit further, you might have seen in your optics lecture that in the back focal plane of the objective lens, you have a Fourier transformation of your object. But Fourier transform of a specimen, if it's a crystalline specimen, you enter the reciprocal space, which means that in the back focal plane of the objective lens, you have an information on the reciprocal lattice of your specimen. And that's exactly your diffraction pattern. We will come closer to this in the lecture about diffraction contrast and diffraction in the TEM. But now let's look more in detail at that real transmission microscope. If you look carefully, you will recognize that the objective aperture, which is in the back focal plane of the objective lens, is very close to the specimen. And that in contrast, the selected area aperture is very far away. A second strange thing is that the objective lens seems to be below its back focal plane. This is absolutely impossible. In reality, you have soft magnetic material which guides the magnetic field produced by the coil of the objective lens to be very close to the specimen. All these distances are in the order of magnitude of a few millimeter. The focal length of the objective lens is generally around two millimeter. The specimen is very close to the front focal plane of the objective lens. What would happen if you would try to draw this exactly? Instead of having the focal point between lens and specimen, we should put it close to the specimen. In that case, when I try to draw the image of my specimen, I will take a point close to the optical axis, passing through the focal point and then exiting parallel to the optical axis. Oops, I have a problem. I can't do my drawing. The image is forming very far away. A second thing that you notice is that if this is my object, the image would have this side, even if it's much further down. That's exactly what happens in the microscope. The magnification by the objective lens is around 50 times. The specimen is very close to the focal point and the image is forming far away from the lenses. Since such a real scale drawing is not practicable, we will always use a sketch with small magnification. We are now remaining with the last building block. To visualize the image or diffraction pattern formed by the objective lens, we use the intermediate and projective lenses. This is the group that is situated after the objective lens. Generally, you have at least one intermediate lens and two projective lenses. Do we really need to draw them to understand how they are working? Actually, we never do it. We stick to the drawing of the objective lens, the one that we have here, which have put a little bit further up. So let's connect all the thing together at that position. I have the specimen, then I have the formation of the diffraction pattern in the back focal plane of the objective lens and the selected area aperture in the first intermediate image. That's the diffraction pattern, the image, and that's my specimen. The current in those intermediate and projective lenses is not chained continuously. It has presets and those presets will help to either project the image of my specimen on the recording device 
And when I do this, I obtain on my camera something that might resemble that. That's a small oxide particle and that's the direct image of this particle. By just doing one press on one knob, I can switch all my lenses and then move to the projection of the diffraction pattern on the recording camera. And in that case, I see directly the diffraction pattern of this small oxide particle. Okay, you will see this interplay between the pre-select of this intermediate and projective lens and those planes in the next part of the lecture where we will show the complete microscope at work together with demonstration on a real TEM. So in today's modules we have seen the three main blocks of lenses that are used first to produce the image of your crossover after the gun to illuminate the specimen, then to make your first image of the specimen and finally to take image or diffraction pattern and view it on your recording device. Next time we will have a look at the complete microscope at work both in diffraction mode and in imaging mode and see how we can control those lenses to really obtain images and diffraction pattern.